This is Burroughs and Badgers. It's a skirmish game. Uh, it's by Osprey Games, written by Michael Lovejoy. It's a hardcover book, about 128 pages. And here's the back of it. And this explains it, um, kind of what you're doing here. And you're wondering what are, because it's a skirmish game of anthropomorphic, <laughs> not a word you hear every day, anthropomorphic animals. And what that means is, and if you need to read this long, go ahead and pause it because I'm going to move the book. And so what it is, is you may go on and uh, play the skirmish game and you're going to play with animals that kind of have human features like hands and they walk upright. So maybe you play a wizard owl in this game or a frog that has a hatchet or an axe, I shouldn't say hatchet, axe. Uh, maybe a hamster that's kind of sneaky, he's got a dagger. Maybe a dog. And so you're going to put a war band together of different types of humanoid animals and go on adventures with them uh, in a skirmish game setting. And uh, as they get better in the game, they get more experience and they can grow as characters. So that's what we're looking at here. So we'll take a look inside and see what this game is all about. All right, this table of contents is going to have your introduction about the game and about the land and the kingdom that this game takes place in, uh, what you're going to need to play the game, how you do turns and how you do actions, and then it goes through the rules of the game, how you're going to actually play the game, how you're going to build your war band up or, you know, well, I want this owl and I want this guy and this guy. So I want these three. How do I put them into the game? So that's what that section is going to be about. How magic is used in the game. And there's different classes of magic. And equipment, skills, and then a campaign setting. And this is how your guys get better. As, they, as your guys uh, survive adventures, they get better. So they're going to get experience and stuff like that. And then here's the scenarios you can play in an appendix and in a roster sheet. All right, the introduction section here, um, it basically goes over the history of the kingdom and they have a map here. So this is what the area is looking like and who, who controls these areas. Like one part I think has like mice running it or rats or something and another part has some shrews running the area. So it goes through the history of this area, but it also talks about uh, what miniatures you could use, um, how you, what playing surface, you know, a like kitchen table, floor, war gaming table, um, how, what train you would need, um, dice. Now the dice uses the ones you're used to, if you're used to role playing games and a lot of different games. There's a D4, of course D6, D8, D10, D12, D20, and then also a D100, which would be two of the D10s. So those are the dice you're going to need in the game. And generally you're going to need one, you're generally going to roll one die if you're doing anything. So you don't need a whole bunch of each of them. Um, also a tape measure to measure distances. Uh, you're going to have to have your roster sheet of what, who's in your war band. So do you have the archer rabbit in your war band and do you have the frog with the axe? They'll have to be written down what their abilities are. So you'll need that roster sheet. And it's downloadable or copyable from the book. All right, basic game concepts. If you've played war games before or anything like that, you're, you're going to be very familiar with a lot of this. Um, how you measure, um, what, they actually put in here May, so, pe so people don't ask, well, can I, can I not? So they explain about May, uh, turns and actions. And um, as I'm going on, these are the illustrations you're going to see is black and white kind of anthropomorphic animals. And what I like about this is, and see, get a close-up look here. This just reminds me of those old childhood, like Aesop fables and stuff, how they were drawn. So they kind of gone with that flavor in this book. So the illustrations are not those full color things. They're going to be these black and white ones like this to kind of bring that old, I want to say old school feel to it. So just thought I'd bring that up since this popped up. Um, and you can see here scenarios based 
how you, you can only re-roll the die once. So if I roll it and want to re-roll it again, whoops, let's say I roll a one and I want to re-roll that, and I roll a one again, I can't re-roll it. That's it. You only get one re-roll on that die. That's what I talked about. You round up if you do fractions. Um, if you're having difficulty, like, no, yes it is, no it's not, the opponent, every, the both players are disagreeing, you can roll a die and whoever gets it. That's what they get. And then how line of sight works. And it's basically, it's a true line of sight. So you look at what the model can see and is the opponent partially concealed for. Or if they're totally concealed, you can't attack them. All right, we're heading to the rules section. And the first part is unit statistics. And I'm going to turn the page because these are actually the statistics used um, for the game. And it kind of gives you an idea of what they're used for. And they're going to have an uh, abbreviation on the sheet. So let me flip to the sheet real quick, kind of let you see what that's going to look like. So this might be a character sheet here. And so you can see M stands for movement. S would be strike and so forth. So it's abbreviated back here. And they're going to have a die value. It can be a D4, it could be a D12, and so forth. And that means if you're trying to do, like shoot a missile attack, if you're a D12, you're going to, or D, you're going to roll a D12. If you're a D10, you're going to roll a D10. And the opponent's going to roll their defense. So let's say Mr. Rabbit here, Mr. Range Attack, has a D8 for his range attack. And Mr. Mouse here, who's like a little nimble, hard little guy to hit, has a D10 for his nimbleness. They're going to roll against each other. There might be some modifiers added or minus from this, but they're going to roll. And I'm actually going to scoot this over. Oh, there's another one of those pictures. And we got a 1 to a 3. Well, this got a 3. This got a 1. This got higher than him. Not tied. Had to be higher than the guy rolling his defense and he succeeded in hitting. So that's what you're going to do. That basically tells you what die you're going to roll for your attack or defense or for a skill check. Also covered in this is if you roll the highest you can roll on a die. So if you roll a 4 on a d4, a 6 on a d6, um, 8 on a d8, and so forth, you get to add 7. So this would not be a 4, but an 11. This would not be a 6, but a 13, and so forth. All right, this is the turn sequence. This is basically the meat and potatoes of how you play the game. First, you're going to have initiative phase, so both players are going to roll off depending upon what stat it is and what die they roll. And the higher person gets to go first. And during the action phase, whoever has the initiative decides, I'm going to activate one of my models that has not activated this turn. And they decide what they want to do with that model. And that is over here. And here's the actions you can do. Um, you can sprint, which means basically you're moving two times. Now, if you look on here, you don't see like move. Well, most of these already have a move associated with the action, like attack. You can move and then attack. And it's basically melee attack. Shoot is, if you want to move, you have to move before you shoot. Just like attack, you have to move before you attack. If you want to move during casting a spell, you have to move. Then you can cast your spell. Search is one that you cannot move. And this is maybe you're trying to find something hidden or something like that. So you're going to do a search in that area. Hide allows your miniature to hide in it's like some piece of terrain and they are allowed to move before they try to hide. So they have to end their movement in something they can hide in. And that allows them to have their remaining movement be used to ambush another character to come by. So maybe this guy snuck in, he's hiding behind something, and this miniature goes by, and he has enough movement, he can come in and attack it. So how do you do your attack? And this kind of explains how damage is going to work. Magic works pretty much the same way. Uh, range attack is going to be the same way. So we're just going to have these two battling it out, just for an example here. So this one is going to attack that one. This has a D6 skill. This one has a D8 for defense. They're going to roll off, and this got a 6, and this got a 7. Well, 
this didn't beat that. But if remember, if you roll the highest you could on a die, you get to add seven. So this is actually a 13. Now, if he would have rolled a five, it would be five versus seven. Five does not beat this. Remember, he's got to beat the defense roll, not equal it, but beat it. So he rolled that six. Plus the seven, got 13. 13 is more than seven. He hit. So how much damage does he do? Uh, weapons may add some damage to it, but we're just going to keep it simple here. Just subtract the difference. So 13 minus 7 is 6. This took 6 damage. And spells, if you beat it, the spell goes off and so forth. Range attack, same way. Now, um, if we look back here on the stat sheet, you have this wound chart. And all animals have the same amount of wounds. It's just maybe they don't have a good defense die, so they're going to take more wounds quickly and it'll be out of more quickly. So it's not like the mouse has four wounds and some big dog creature has ten. It's everybody has the same. And if you look at box number four, eight, twelve, fifteen, and sixteen are a little darker. That means every time you get a wound to this point, every die roll you're going to make is a minus one. When he gets here, now you're a minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, and then we're out of the game once you take a wound past that point. Now, how do you move? It, you may be, some things may be a movement of D6. Some things may be a movement of D10. So how does that play out? Well, if you're just moving normally, you just move six if you're D6, six inches. If you're D10, you're going to get to move 10 inches, and the member sprint can go double that. But there are some difficult terrain, and so if you're ever going to go into difficult terrain, you actually have to roll the die, and that's how far you can actually move. So this one could actually move four inches, where this one oh, can also move four. So uh, the D is just used for if you're moving through difficult terrain. If not, whatever D it is, that's how many inches that character can move. Um, you can also, there's also morale in this game where your characters may leave the game because you've suffered too many losses. And so that's basics of the game. It tells you how you can move, you can climb up surfaces, you can jump, how spells are cast. Um, it's all to do with what die do you roll and does the attacker beat the defender. And if he does, by how much, that's how many wounds that defender is going to take. All right, we're in the warband section, and this is basically how do you build you know, if you want to take these into the game, how do you do that? And this goes through this section, or it's in this section. And basically goes through starting how much, uh, you have like 350 pennies. So they're going to use pennies in this game. Let's, you don't have to have real pennies, but that's what they're using for currency to buy your war man. You're going to have a leader and a second in command like most games have. You can also get, anybody can be a magic user, and it goes through the rules about the magic users. You're also going to choose a den, and you get a special little thing that happens if you choose that. So if you choose the abandoned burrow, for example, this is what you're going to get. Then there's the, um, you can have to do upgrades. And the roster sheets is, like I said, it's back here, but it's also downloadable. Um, it goes through the races, and so these are our races, not all of them, I got another page of them. So we got small, and it shows what base they're going to be on. Here's the medium, and it, they're statted out already, so you can see if this one wants to do a move, it's going to be able to move six inches, where this one's going to be able to move eight inches, and so forth, and it shows what die they're going to use on attack and defense, any special skills they come with how much they cost. If we go to the next page, we got some large beasts and some massive beasts. So those are going to be your choices uh, that come in this book. And it talks about, well, if you want to build a standard war band, you kind of do a mix of these so you're kind of versatile. But they also go through uh, what rare beasts are and the limitations to that. And then if you just want to go, I just want to play an all mouse army, um, you can do that, and what restrictions could be lifted because you're going that route. They also, 
in this land of, I forgot what it's called. <laughs> um, let me go back to this uh, North Embra, okay? There are different uh, factions you can join. And like the Royalist, it tells you a little bit about them, um, what you're going to get, and the Den you can choose. There's also the Rogues you can join, the Free Beasts, and the Wild Beasts. And again, it tells you their history, what you're going to get with them, and the Den you get to choose for choosing that faction. And so that's what's included in this section of... Somewhere back here, it's the Warbands, I know. There it is, Warbands. All right, this section that goes over magic, and mostly it's the spells used in the game. Um, there's different schools of magic, and we'll take a look at a couple of them. One of them is natural magic, and you kind of can see right here, what it gives kind of a definition of what that type of class does. And then here's some of the spells. And so the target is, this is what the caster needs to roll on their D, whatever it is, depending upon up here, it tells you what they're going to use. So fortitude, so they're going to use fortitude. Needs a line of sight and range of 18 inches. So it kind of gives that information, kind of gives a blurb about the, not so much in-game effect, but what they're trying to achieve in the game from this, and then what the actual game effect will be, and then ingredients. I, you can run out of ingredients and you couldn't cast a spell. So a lot of these spells take ingredients. And there's the curse. Then we have the cure, luck, lightning, and push. So those are the natural spells. Then if we look at light magic, and again, here's the definition of it, and then the different light spells that can be cast. There's pretty much six spells for each class. And there's that. So the other classes are dark magic, and this basically you're trying to take control of another opponent. Now, not so much take control, maybe you're causing them pain, or you do actually take control of the opponent, or you, you cause wounds to that opponent, but then you heal because you did that. Um, there's also wild magic, which has to do with nature, so think druids from like a lot of role-playing games. Maybe you can get bear's strength, so your strength goes up. Earthshaker, you cause an earthquake on a piece of terrain that causes damage to the opponents. Uh, tangle weeds, the weeds come up and start restricting people's movement. Unbound magic is basically scientific form of magic, um, like a cloak of concealment. You can create a cloak of concealment. You have a fiery blast, kind of not really a fireball, but you've sent a ball of fire at an opponent. Um, a portable protector is basically a, a magical shield appears in front of you to protect you from attacks. There is the last one, which is noble magic. And this one, you can teleport. Um, one of them is radiance. You're so bright and everything, the opponents can't look at you. So those requiring you to have line of sight the opponent, to see the opponent, or see you, that opponent cannot attack you. And revelation is you reveal all enemy, hidden enemy figures within a certain range. So those are the different classes of spells, and each of them have six, and that has to do with magic. All right, the next section has to do with uh, equipment. And instead of going, like, explaining it all, they're all right here. Um, so there's the weapons that you can choose from, and they have like range on them. Maybe they have a special ability, and they'll explain that in a section, like one-handed weapons, they'll explain what the special ability may be for that. Um, there's also armor you can buy, and what effect they would have. And basically, what armor does is reduces the amount of damage you take. It doesn't make it, some armors could make it easier for you to be hit, but they also reduce the amount of damage you're gonna take. So if you take three damage and you've got armor that takes away two, you only took one damage. And then items such as rope and hooks, um, talisman, mages focus, and so forth that you can also have in the game. So that's going to be our equipment list here. All right, this is the skill section 
and there's several different types of skill classes, so like this one's fighting. We'll take a look at the fighting skills, and I'll explain what the other skills are, and they're going to be pretty self-explanatory when I tell you the other categories. So fighting skills, um, there's things like Killing Blow, Melee Master, uh, Parry, Born in Harness. Now, this is one problem I'm having with this book is like this, is this is not alphabetical. So if you're looking for a certain skill, um, you're going to have to look at each one if you're not sure which one it belongs to. So, I mean, K's before M, before P, before B, and so forth. So kind of be aware of that. And we'll go to the next page, of fighting skills. And if you need to, you can pause the video to kind of look at them. And there we go. So that's going to be all of the fighting skills. There's also a class of shooting skills, of cunning skills, like being kind of sneaky and roguish, strength skills, so you can be a little bit stronger, movement skills, and the last class of skills is really innate. And really you can't, there's one you can choose from, but most of them you can't choose because it might be flight. Well, birds are going to have flight. So what does flight mean? And that's where that is going to explain that. So this section deals with the skills. And so you have your fighting skills, shooting skills, cunning skills, strength skills, movement skills, and then what innate skills your creature or anthropomorphic creature may have. All right, this is the campaign section. And it kind of like how you start a campaign, what you do before the campaign starts, then you actually go into playing the game. But the rest of this is really about what happens after a game. First thing you do is if a character is taken out of the game, may not mean they're permanently removed from the game, from, from future campaigns. They may become injured, they may heal, they may die. And so you'll have a chart you roll on to see if they survive that. Um, there's things you can do off-duty to try to earn more money, maybe some prestige or experience or something like that. Do you want to upgrade your den? Um, if you get enough experience, um, you're going to roll a die for that character and see if what happens with that experience. Uh, maybe they go up in a skill, um, their stat goes up and so forth. Um, you have to pay for upkeep on your characters, feeding them and stuff like that. Um, do you want to hire new people? Uh, do you want to go to market and buy more equipment? Which is like that chart I showed you earlier here, and here's the magic um, spell components, or spell ingredients, they call it here. And also some rare items may be offered to your characters in the market. Then you figure out what is your war band's actual, actual rating, and we'll get to that in the next page. And it talks about fate points that you can spend to have rerolls and how many you're allowed to have. And then here's the war band rating I was talking about. So we'll zoom in here, and you kind of and you add up your total, and that's kind of like level. Maybe this is level five, and the opponent's a level three. Just kind of give it kind of a role playing, thinking of it that way. So if there is an imbalance in the total, like one opponent is 50 and others 20 points for their war band, well, that's a 30 point difference. Um, what do you do? And that's where they talk about here about balancing that game out. And so that is the campaign section. All right, this is the scenario section. There is actually only eight scenarios. Uh, it may look like more, but one to four is uh, open battle, and here's open battle again. So these are the eight scenarios. Uh, we'll take a look at the first two. The first one is what you're used to. Set up table however you want and go battle each other. When somebody's uh, war band has a routing or morale failure and leaves the game, the other person wins. So that's what this one is about. But let's take a look at the second one, which is ambush the camp. So it's going to set up kind of a storyline of what's happened, what's happening, um, how you set up train, how you deploy the war bands, any special rules that's used in this game, uh, secondary objective, uh, starting the game, ending the game, and then what experience you can get for 
participating in this scenario. So that is the scenario, ambush the camp. And so those are our eight scenarios presented in the book. Well, that was Burroughs and Badgers. Um, as far as the book goes, there's one thing that kind of bugs me. And that's back here. There's no index. So if you're looking for a certain word like weak, what does weak mean? Well, where is that in the books? So you have to learn where that kind of stuff is at. Uh, that's one of the problems I have with that. I do, otherwise, I do really like the book. I like this faded, kind of giving it an old look, like an old, like uh, Aesop's Fables, like old look, like even with the pictures. I really do like these pictures. It kind of themes well with the book, and they have the color photos to go with it. So I like that guy. So I really do like how they laid out the book, except for they need a way to find like uh, strong, what does strong mean? I have to know where to look for that. But other than that, um, there's a lot of skirmish games out there. Why would I want to play this one? I mean, there's like Dracula's America, Frostgrave, Archipelago's Ghost, and so forth. Why would I choose that one, this one? Well, one of them is these, but of course I've been using these in Frostgrave, so that would be, yeah, maybe a reason is because it's more themed to this. But another one is um, Frostgrave, you're using D20 versus D20, and there could be a huge swing. One person can roll one and the other in a 20, and that's like 19 damage right there. And that is a huge swing compared to one person is rolling 10s and the other person rolling D10, the other person's rolling a D6. Well, this person rolls a seven. Oh, there's just no way this person can beat them. Yeah, they can. If they roll a six, they get to add seven, they're at a 13. They beat them. So it doesn't matter what this person rolls, they're not going to be able to, be able to beat that, even if they roll a nine. But if they do roll a 10, then they're at a 17 and they can beat them. So it doesn't have that huge swing that I feel you get with Frostgrave. Um, other than that, it's pretty much the same as any other skirmish game. You guys can get experience, they can go up. Uh, there is a way to create magic in this game. Um, so, really, if, if you like the theming, like, hey, you know, we get to use these anthropom I wanted to just say it, anthropomorphic animals, um, which look pretty neat on the table, actually, when people are playing against each other with them. Uh, and if you like fantasy setting, and you like creating your own magic and your spells, this might be the game for you also. And if you like using different type of dice for a contest instead of just rolling a d20 against each other, so you don't have those huge wild swings, this might be the game for you.